all of humanity, rather all of creation, to be obsessed with him, to love him. And if you ask about the type of love that the universe had for this marvel of a human being, I say to you five statements. This was a love that made stone speak. A father, a counselor, a judge, a teacher, a warrior, greatest of all creation to ever have set foot on the face of the earth. These are some of the descriptions of the Prophet of Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Almighty said to him very early in his mission, O oh, you covered up, rise and warn. And he would rise and he would warn and he would stand and he would teach and he would travel and cry and bleed and weep and he would not sit down till Allah Almighty's mission had been complete and the message of Islam had been delivered until his blessed soul was ready to return back to Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala after 23 long grueling years of sacrifice and dua and jihad and patience and compassion and conveying and sleepless nights and recovery from injury 23 of those years and it got to a point where towards the end of his life he wouldn't even have the ability to stand on his two feet when praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because his fatigued feet were unable to carry him and that is why Muslim narrates that our mother Aisha radiallahu anha would be asked the question Did you ever see your husband Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa praying sat down? And she said yes after the bashing in that people had given him He was unable to stand It's the likes of this work ethic And limitless ocean of sacrifice and endless seas of compassion and never ending struggle that caused all of humanity rather all of creation to be obsessed with him to love him and if you ask about the type of love that the universe had for this marvel of a human being I say to you five statements this was a love that made stone speak. This was a love that caused tree trunks to speak and to weep. It was a love that moved trees from their places. It was a love that caused camels to weep when they saw him. And it was a love that humbled lions and made them stop in their tracks. If you ask about some of the miracles which he came with, alayhi salatu wasalam, I respond and I say, these are five from the hundreds of miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had supported him with. And allow me to elaborate on each and one of these, each one of these five. We said that this was a love that made stone speak. This dear brother, dear sister, is not a mistake of a statement that you just heard, nor is it an exaggeration. Muslim narrates on the authority of Jabir ibn Samura that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I know of a rock in Mecca that used to give me salam, greetings, before I became a messenger. He said, I know where that rock is at this moment in time. Imagine before he became a messenger, a normal human being without prophethood or revelation, he would walk past a particular rock, that rock would say to him, Salaamu Alaikum, O Messenger of Allah. Preparation from Allah. So he knew something was about to happen in his life. Love that caused stone to speak. And that wouldn't be the only incident. Inanimate objects would continue making their voices heard in his presence. Abu Dhar, the companion, he said, he said, I myself was present on a particular day when we were sat in a study circle with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and in his hand were pebbles. 
and then the pebbles began to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We heard the sounds of the pebbles speaking. Abu Dhar said in that gathering was Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and all of them heard the voice of the pebbles saying Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah in the hand of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was a love that caused rocks to speak. What was the second statement? We said, it was love that caused tree trunks to weep. This again is no exaggeration. Muslim narrates on the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah that the Messenger وسلم, used to give the khutbah, the Friday sermon, next to a tree trunk. You can say it was around maybe uh, knee height or width, uh, waist height. He would lean on it as he was delivering his sermon. And then a man from the Ansar, and in another narration, a woman from the Ansar, they said to the Prophet وسلم, would you like for us to build for you a minbar, a pulpit like this? Shall we build for you a pulpit so that you can sit, rest, speak to the companions? He said, yeah, why not? So they built for him the pulpit. So now he was no longer next to the tree trunk. The very first sermon he gave, subhanAllah al -Azim. Away from the tree trunk, he began to speak. The narrator Jabir, he said, the tree trunk began to scream. A scream that we all heard. And this narration has come to us from numerous chains of transmission because it was a public gathering when this happened. All of the companions, they heard this. It began to scream like a baby who was very displeased. So he came down from the pulpit. He went next to the tree trunk and he hugged it, subhanAllah. You talk about the tree huggers, right? He was the first to hug a tree, alayhi salatu wasalam. He hugged the tree and he kept it there in his arms. The narrator said it began to moan and it began to inhale rapidly like a child does when his mother is calming him down, subhanAllah. And he stayed there until it quietened. And then he turned to the companions saying to them what that was all about. And he said to, her, he said to them, it was crying because it missed hearing the remembrance when it was standing, when I was standing beside it. In another narration, which a darimi narrates, it adds to this narration. And it said, he said, I swear by Allah who possesses my life. He said, I swear by Allah who possesses my life. If I had not left my pulpit and hugged the tree, it would have continued crying all the way until the day of judgment because of grief and sorrow. Now that the messenger sallallahu was no longer standing next to it. And so he instructed the companions to cut down the tree trunk and to bury it, as if to say that the grief it went through was so strong that the best place for it now would be, would be six feet under, subhanAllah. Love that caused stones to speak, love that caused trees to weep, love that caused, this is heading number three, love that caused trees to move from their places. This is a reality, my brother, my sister. This is not Lord of the Rings. This is not something Hocus Pocus or Harry Potter. This is a reality. The narration I'm going to share with you now, this is in Sahih Muslim on the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah. It's a very authentic narration. It happened. Jabir, he said, we were traveling with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam till we arrived at a valley that was so fragrant. And the Messenger وسلم, needed to relieve himself, to respond to the call of nature. He said, and I was following him carrying a container of water. And he looked around to find anything which he could cover himself with. He couldn't find anything. So he looked to the right side of the valley. He saw a tree by itself. And the other end of the valley, there was another tree. So he made his way to one of the two trees. Jabir said, I followed him. And I saw that he was pulling one of the tree trunks or one of the branches from the tree. And then he said to the tree, he spoke to the tree. He said to it, follow me by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, and therefore the tree began to pull itself out from the soil, obeying him, following him like the animal that is obedient to its master. 
holding the hand of a tree and walking with it till he got to the other side of the valley. He got to the other side of the valley, he took one of the tree trunks, one of the branches from the tree, he pulled it, he said, follow me by the permission of Allah. It began to follow him. Now he is walking in the middle of the valley with two trees behind him. And then he got to the middle of the valley, and then he said, cover me by the permission of Allah. So they began to cover him, the leaves and the branches till he was non-visible. Jabir, he said, I realized that I was looking. So I quickly gave him my back and I began to play with some stones, waiting for him to finish. And then I looked back at some point and I saw him walking towards me. He had relieved himself and the two trees had returned back to the two ends of the valley. La ilaha illallah. Love that caused trees to move from their places. And that would be, wouldn't be the first nor the last time that this would happen. Ya'la ibn Murrah, another companion, he said three things I will never forget seeing in front of me happening with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said one of them was a day when we were traveling with him alayhi salatu wa sallam and then he was resting to camp. And when he was asleep, a tree got up from its place and began to move. Pulling itself out from the soil ripping the roots out from the earth and walking as if it was a human being till it got to right in front of him and then it covered him. He was asleep. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Say sallallahu alayhi wasallam, my brothers. Every time you hear his name, say sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then the tree removed itself and went back to its place. When he woke up, alayhi salatu wasalam, Ya'la ibn Murrah, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu when you are asleep, you won't believe what happened. X, Y, and Z happened. He said to me, yeah, this is not strange. He said, this was a tree that sought permission from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to give salam to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Allah gave it permission. A tree is yearning to give salam to the Prophet of Allah Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. So how can we become stingy brothers and sisters and not say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Allahu Akbar. A love that calls stones to speak, a love that calls tree trunks to weep, love that calls trees to move from their places. Number four was love that caused animals to weep upon seeing his radiant face, alayhi salatu Imam Abu Dawood narrates on the authority of Jabir that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam once entered the garden of a man from the Ansar who owned camels. And the moment the camel saw the face of the Habib alayhi salatu wasalam, it began to, it began to weep. And so he made his way to the camel and he began to pass his hand over its temple until it relaxed and settled. Then he turned to the companions. He said, who is the owner of this camel? One of the men from the Ansar, he said, it's mine. A young man, he said, it's mine, Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he gave him an earful. He said to him, he said, will you not fear Allah? With regards to this camel, which Allah Almighty has placed under your possession, the camel just complained to me that you are making him go hungry and you're giving him too many tasks. Subhanallah. You and I perhaps thought it was just Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam, whom Allah had given the ability to understand the language of the animals. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu had given part of this to our very own Habib alayhi salatu wasalam. Subhanallah. And finally we said this was a love that humbled lions and caused them to stop in their tracks. Have you heard of Safina ship? Yeah. So you have a companion nicknamed Safina Ship. His actual name is Qais. He is the one who is about to narrate the hadith that you're going to hear now. Which Al-Hakim records in his Mustadrak. Safina, his name is Qais. And there are other narrations to say he had different names. And he was given this name of ship because he had the ability, mashallah, to carry so many things during the travel. The Messenger وسلم, would load upon him. He would say, give me more. And he would load, he would say, give me more. He said, mashallah, it's like you are a Safina. It's like you are a ship. So his name became Safina and it became his favorite nickname as well. 
I mean, this was a righteous man who grew up in the house of our mother, Ummu Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, a young man. He narrates that he was once traveling by sea. He was traveling by sea. He said, and then I had a disrepair in the ship. My boat that I was using, it fell into disrepair, it broke. I was on the verge of drowning. I was holding on to one of the planks till it took me to the edge of a coast. It was a jungle. I got onto my feet and no sooner had I raised my head that I could now see a lion pelting towards me. <laughs> Finished, game over. This is his janazah. So what is he going to say? He's going to remember Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and then his beloved Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He will say, father of Harith. This is one of the names of the lion in the Arabic language. The lion the same as many things, they have many names. Lion has no less than 300 names in the Arabic language, by the way. He said, Abu Harith, Lion, Abu Harith, I am Safina, the servant of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Subhanallah, the lion stopped in his tracks. Have you heard of anything like this before? It stopped in his tracks. He said, and then it approached me very gently and it began to nudge me with its shoulder. I took the impression that it wanted me to go somewhere. I was lost. So there I am being pushed by the lion gently by its shoulder till it found my, it helped me find the way out of the jungle. And then it began to make very gentle noises as if to say which my interpret interpretation, he said, led me to believe it was bidding me farewell. What did he say to Abu Harith? I am Safina servant of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he is recognized in the animal world La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah Didn't we say that his love was unconditional and loved by the universe as well by the inanimate objects what then about you dear brother dear sister what type of love should we feel towards him here we can ask a second question if this was the type of love that animals and stones and insects had towards him, what then about the men and women who saw him, who traveled with him, who heard his recitation of the Quran and prayed behind him? What type of love must they have had? Subhanallah. I mentioned to you a description or maybe a summary of the answer to that question by saying to you, it was a love that caused them to compete over the water that would fall off his body when making wudu ablution. Imagine. And the one who said this was an enemy of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Do you know his name? His name is Urwa ibn Mas'ud al thaqafi Urwa, he saw how the companions behaved with the Prophet when he went to the other side to negotiate with the Muslims. He couldn't believe what he saw. This narration is in Sahih al-Bukhari on the authority of Al-Miswar ibn Makhrama. Urwa, he said, after seeing how they behaved, he went back to the pagans. He said to them, they're not going to hand him over. And let me tell you what I saw. He said, hey, oh my people, I have visited kings before. I have visited myself, the emperor of Rome, the emperor of Persia, and the Abyssinian king, I have met them myself. Wallah, however, by Allah. He said, nevertheless, in my life, I have never seen a community who honor their king more than the honoring of the companions to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he elaborates upon what he saw. <coughs> he said, let me explain. Wallahi, he said, even the spittle that would come out of his fragrant mouth, Fragrant are my words, he didn't use that, he was an enemy. Even the spittle that would come out of his mouth, it would find its way to the hand of a companion who would use it to wipe over his body and wipe over his face. How blessed they were, how lucky they were, Allahu Akbar. This is a khasiyyah, an exclusive quality to him and him alone. Not your shaykh, not my shaykh, only him, alayhi salatu wasalam. He would wipe over his face, they would wipe over their face and their bodies with the spittle of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Allah has placed barakah in that. And then they said, and whenever he instructed them to do something, they rushed to fulfill the instruction. And whenever he would do his ablution, it was as if they were on the verge of killing one another. 
fighting over the remains of the water. And when he spoke, it was silence. They wanted to hear what he had to say. And not one of them would look him straight in the eye. Not one of them would look him straight in the eye because of the awe and the love and the respect that they had for him. Imagine Abu Bakr and Umar and Sa'd ibn Mu'adh and maybe Khalid later on with their heads down, unable to look at the face of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because of the sheer respect and love. Amr ibn al-As, before he would pass away, he would say there is nobody on planet Earth who I love more than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yet till this day, if you were to ask me to describe him how he looks, I will not be able to give you a description because I couldn't fill my eyes from his beautiful face. I couldn't. Alayhi salatu was salam. What type of love did the human beings have for him, the companions? I'm not going to share with you now, dear brother, dear sister. Uh, narrations from time of ease, comfort. When the AC is on, when the heating is on, when we're sat in carpets, beautiful LED lights around us. No, no, I'm not going to share with you examples of love in those times of comfort. That's easy to claim love. I would like to share with you perhaps four examples during times of difficulty. I'm sure you will agree with me that during times of war, for example, is when you see the true love that a person has for another. When it's either your life or his. Let me share with you these four episodes, these four scenarios. Scenario number one, the Battle of Badr. Were the Muslims ready for the Battle of Badr? They had left for travel with basic clothing, basic equipment, just about to hunt an animal. They were not going for war. And all of a sudden, without prior arrangements, it was the Qadr of Allah. They find themselves squaring up to 1,000 men, clad to their teeth with artillery, ready to fight. Abu Jahl and the rest of his team, La ilaha illallah. The Muslims did not want this. And here the Messenger وسلم, carries out a meeting, pre-war consultation. He wouldn't impose his opinions upon other. As long as it wasn't Quran or Sunnah, it wasn't revelation, he was not there to impose his opinion on others. It's a worldly matter, let us talk about it. This is war. So he gathered the companions, he said to them, what is your opinion? The, situ the situation that we're in. What is your opinion? Who would be the first to speak? Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he would give a beautiful khutbah, a beautiful sermon. We are with you till our last breath. And then Umar Amir al Mu'mineen would stand up and he would speak and gave a beautiful sermon, no less beautiful than Abu Bakr, saying, We're with you unconditionally. And then Al Miqdad ibn Amr would get up and speak. And he said beautiful words that the companions would envy him for. MashaAllah, it was tawfiq. Allah inspired him to say these words because our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam needed to hear those words. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, proceed to what Allah Almighty has commanded you to do. We are with you. And we will not say to you like the children of Israel said to their Prophet Musa, go, you and your Lord, fight. We are staying right here. That's what they said to him. Go, you and your Lord, fight. We're staying right here. He said, we will say to you, go, you and your Lord, and fight. We are right behind you fighting. The Messenger وسلم, was happy to hear this. But once again, he said, give me your opinion, O people. You'd think it'd be enough, right? You'd think he'd heard what he needed to hear. No. What was he waiting for? The opinion of the Ansar. Abu Bakr, Umar al miqdad this represents some of the companions, the Muhajirun, the immigrants. What about the Ansar? He hasn't heard from them. And he had made an agreement with them that if I need help from you, it's within your territory. They're outside of Medina now. So, so he wants to know if, if, if they have his back, if they're up for it. This is life and death. They may not go home after this day, and many of them didn't go home. Give me your opinion, O from the Ansar. Give me your opinion, O people, without specifying. Sa'ad 
Ibn Mu'adh recognized what the Messenger وسلم, was hinting at, and he was the first to, re to realize it. So, Messenger of Allah, وسلم, I think you are indicating an opinion from us, the Ansar. O Messenger of Allah, allow me to speak, because I am Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, I represent the Ansar, and they will not behave or speak before I do. Therefore, allow me to speak on all of their behalf. Messenger of Allah, proceed to what Allah Almighty has commanded you to do. Take from our money as you wish. Leave from our money as you wish. Make ties with whomever you wish. Cut ties with whomever you wish. Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you were to travel to Bark Ghamdan, 500 kilometers away from Medina, a very difficult terrain. If you were to travel to Bark Ghamdan, we will be right behind you. Rather, if you were to plunge into the sea for war, you will find us right behind you in the middle of the ocean. This was when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became convinced that it is the correct thing to do. And Allah Jalla Jalaluhu would then send the army of the angels to support those believers because they deserved it. That's when love is expressed. When you don't know if you're going to come home or not. The second scenario I wanted to share with you is before the battle of Badr erupted. Our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is now, imagine, imagine lining up the lines. Making sure that his men are standing straight. And with him was a stick. And then he came across a companion called Sawad ibn Ghaziyyah. Sawad ibn Ghaziyyah had a bit of a belly going on. And so he prodded him because he was stepping a little bit out of line. He prodded him, he said to him, stand in line, O Sawad. Sawad said, Messenger of Allah, you, you, you've hurt me. That hurt. And Allah Almighty has sent, you, has sent you with truth and justice, so allow me to prod you back. Surely this is not the appropriate time to seek revenge. Leave it until after war, right? No, Sawad had a plan. The Messenger وسلم, the Imam of Justice, stood in front of Sawad and he said, yes, of course. And he raised his garment, he said, prod me back. He uncovered his belly, he said, prod me back. And then Sawad pounced onto the body of the Prophet وسلم, and hugged him very tightly and kissed him in the middle of his torso. He said, Sawad, what made you do that? He said, Messenger of Allah وسلم, You see the situation that we're in. It's likely that we're not going to ever return home to our families. And so I wanted the last thing that I experienced from this life contact with your blessed body, subhanAllah. Who thinks of that? What would Ali be thinking of shortly before war? I may not have been thinking of that, but these were the men and women who loved the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhanAllah al -azim. And then after the war, and this is after the battle of Uhud now, a different battle. And this is the third scenario I wanted to share with you. To show you that it wasn't just the men who loved him alayhi salatu wasalam, unconditionally, but it was the women as well. And they have amazing stories in this department. A woman from the tribe of Dinar, Ibn Hisham narrates, was given the news that her husband had been killed after Uhud. And she said, what happened to the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasalam? They said to her, we are very sorry to tell you that your brother has also been slain. She said, what happened to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? They said to her, forgive us for giving you this heavy news on this day, your father has been slain. She said, what happened to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? They said, Alhamdulillah, he is well. She said, no, no, point him out. Point him out to me so that I can see him with my own eyes. They said, look over there, over there, can you see him? She looked, and then when she saw him, they heard her mutter some words to herself. What did she say? She said, every calamity in life is small, so long as you are okay. Father, brother, husband, no husband to go home with that evening. She said, every calamity is small, as long as you are okay. 
That's why Allah chose them to be his companions. And Allah chose Ali Hamouda to live 1400 years after them. That's their quality. This is our quality. May Allah forgive us and inspire our hearts with true love for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The fourth scenario I wanted to share with you is something that happened after the Battle of Uhud had subsided. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Zayd ibn Thabit, go back to the battlefield and look for Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah. We can't find him. Do you know Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah? One of the chiefs of the Ansar, one of the earliest to embrace Islam. Where is Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah? We can't see him. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Zayd ibn Thabit, go and look for Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah. And if you meet him, say to him, I say to him, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. And so Zayd ibn Thabit, he returns back to the battlefield of Uhud. Imagine stepping over the corpses, stepping over the bowels, stepping over the ripped apart limbs and the skewed appearances and the skulls and the blood and the flesh, all of it for the sake of the King Allah Jalla Jalla. May Allah give them Jannah. And he looks for Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah until he finally finds him on the ground, heavily wounded, breathing his last. His soul was rattling. He was not going to live. Zayd ibn Thabit leans down to Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah and he whispers into his ear saying to him, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has sent me to you giving you salam. And he said, how do you feel? Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah with a terribly weak voice responds to Zayd by saying to him, return to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the salam from me. And O oh Zayd, I would like you to convey a message to my people, the Ansar. Say to my people, the Ansar, that you have no excuse in front of Allah. If any harm touches the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whilst any one of you has an eye that blinks. Those were his last words. He couldn't continue and his blessed soul would return back to Allah Jalla Jalalu. That was his farewell message, thinking about his teacher, thinking about the Imam of all Imams, the Messenger Muhammad Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. Allahu Akbar. Why all of this love now we ask? What was it that they saw in him that caused this obsession, dear brothers and sisters? What did they see? What did they hear? Allow me to explain some of what they saw. They saw in him a human being who was a perfect embodiment of all of the values that he called towards. He invited them to be good people, then they saw in him the best of them all. He commanded them to be brave. And so he was the bravest of all people. You look at his bravery, you would think that Allah had only sent him to rearrange the armies, to appoint the generals, to lead the warriors, to strengthen the hearts of the soldiers when they were weak. al bara he would say, whenever the intensity of war would become severe, we would hide behind the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the bravest companion would be the one who would be able to stand side by side with him on battle because he was advancing Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. He didn't fear death. He commanded them to be generous. They saw in him the most generous of Allah's creation, describing him like the wind that blows and scatters money, bending on people as if he does not fear poverty. He was the king of his wealth, his wealth was not the king of him. His feet was not in his, his money was not in his heart, his money was beneath his feet. This is where we make a mistake, dear brothers and sisters. Money did not manipulate him, he manipulated his money where he sourced it from and how he invested it to use his money as a vehicle to bring him to Jannah. He was the most generous of all people, you'd think that Allah had only sent him to spend on the poor and to pay the debts of those in need. He commanded the Muslims to be compassionate and gentle. You look at him alayhi salatu wasalam, and you would think Allah had sent him for no other purpose other than to pass a gentle caring hand over the head of the orphan and to support the widow and to give encouraging advice to those who were let down and to respond to the invitations of the downtrodden in society and to eat from their food even if it was about to go off he would not break their hearts and visit those who are handicapped and disabled 
you would think Allah had sent him for no other reason other than to be compassionate and kind. He commanded his companions to be worshippers of Allah Jalla Jalalu. So what did they see in him? A marvel of a worshipper. A man who would fast continuously, pray at night continuously, till Allah Almighty would say to him, take it easy on yourself. A man whose feet would grow in size because of swelling and pain, whose skin would crack because of continuous salah. A man who would soak his beard and the soil beneath him and his clothes from his own tears. And his wives would be patting the bed, patting the soil to see where the husband has gone. And their hands would fall on his feet as he was bowing and prostrating to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu in the masjid. They would say, you are in one place and we are in another. Subhanallah. Worshipper of Allah. A man who frequently looked into the heavens and frequently looked onto the earth. He recognized the grandeur of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. A worshipper of Allah. This is why you love him. This is why they loved him. This is why we love him, brothers and sisters. Next, before we conclude, I would like to share with you some of the statements made by those men and women who just missed him. See, there are 400 or so years between us and him. Yet when we hear his name, we feel that our hearts are about to break. We miss him so much. 1,400 years. I want you to think about a man who missed him by just one year. Last year, the Prophet of Allah وسلم, was alive. I missed him by one year. I could have been a companion and seen him. I will never see him again till the day of judgment. Imagine the pain. You see his hair left behind in the homes of his wives. You meet his wives. You meet his, some of his children. You see his clothes. You feel the walls of the house. And imagine, imagine those who missed him by just a month. Those who missed him by just a week. Those who missed him by a few hours, they come into Medina to meet the Prophet of God. They say, we've just buried him. And that is why Imam Muslim narrates that a man came to Al-Miqdad ibn Al-Aswad, a companion. This man was a tabi'i, a second generation Muslim. He didn't see the Prophet. He said, Miqdad, how blessed are those two eyes of yours? that saw the face of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I wish that we saw what you saw and witnessed what you witnessed. Thabit al-Bunani, who was the servant of Anas ibn Malik, who was the servant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thabit did not meet the messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam. What did Thabit say to Anas? Subhanallah, imagine, think about it, right? Looking into the face of a person, looking into his eyes, knowing those eyes saw the face of Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa Thabit, he said to Anas, he said, please lend me your two eyes for a moment. Lend me your two eyes for a moment just so that I may kiss those eyes that saw the face of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ishaq at he would say whenever the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would remember him after he died, their skins would shiver and serenity khushur would fill the room and they would begin to cry. Imam Malik, whenever he would mention hadith, teaching the companions in Medina, whenever he would mention the name of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the color of his face would change and he would begin to lean forward as if he was injured. And they would say to him, how come you experience this whenever you mention the name of the Messenger He said to them, if you saw what I saw, you would behave the same. They said, what did you see? He said, I saw the great Imam Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir. Whenever he would mention the name of the Prophet Muhammad in a class, he would stop and cry and cry and cry till we would just feel sorry for him. He was the Imam of all Imams and the greatest of all creation, a man whom Allah Almighty had completed his outward and inward splendor. Let's not deny it and bury our heads in the sand and pretend that outward appearance doesn't matter. It does matter. And that is why Allah Jalla Jalaluhu decreed that all of the prophets and messengers would be upright and would be handsome and would be the fullest of men, physically speaking and inwardly as well. Allah knows this is the nature of man. 
He judges, she judges by appearance. It is true that when you see a person who is beautiful physically, but when you see their bad manners, they look beautiful. They look ugly. However, when you see somebody who is beautiful in manners, and beautiful in appearance, then the circle of love and attraction is complete. Thus Allah would decree that all of the messengers would be the finest of men. And our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the finest of them all. A quick description of his appearance. How did he look alayhi salatu wa salam? I share with you the words of those men and women who saw him. And you will notice that between the lines, you read not just a description, but you read obsessive love. Look at the words of Ka'b ibn Malik, a companion who saw him. What did he say in description of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, whenever the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would smile, his face would illuminate. His face would radiate as if it was part of the moon. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he would say the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was white in complexion. It was almost as if he, Allah had fashioned him from silver. Jabir ibn Samura, he would say, I once saw the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the night. When the moon was full and the sky was clear, and I began to look at him and look back at the moon. And look back at him and look at, back at the moon. The time he was wearing a red garment. And I came to the conclusion that he is far more beautiful than the moon. What about the description of Al-Bara? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was of perfect human proportions. Meaning not too tall, not too short, not too wide, not too slim. Perfect proportions. And I once saw him wearing a red garment in my life. I have never seen anything that was more beautiful than him. Alayhi salatu was salam. A man whose face was round like the moon. His color was as some have described was a harvest moon. Whitish with maybe a vanilla tint to it with a reddish tint as well in his cheeks. A man whose eyes were intensely dark and the white of his eyes were intensely white. So that when he was looking around you know that he was looking at you. A man whose, white, whose mouth was perfect, very wide, so that when he speaks, he is clear and eloquent. There was no ambiguity in his speech. His eyebrows were finely arched and his eyelashes were long and his hair would reach down to his earlobe, sometimes to his shoulder. Alayhi salatu was salam, the finest of all men. Ummu Sulaim, la ilaha illallah, would carry a container carrying or catching the droplets of sweat falling off the forehead of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was taking his siesta nap. He woke up and he saw her there <laughs> with a container catching the droplets as they fall from his head. He said, Ummu Sulaim, what are you doing? She said, Messenger of Allah, we take your perspiration and we mix it with our scents and it becomes the most amazing of all fragrances. Alayhi salatu was salam. Anas ibn Malik, who served him for 10 years. You want a description? Take it from a man who served him for 10 years. He said, in my life, I have never felt any silk or brocade that was softer than the palm of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And in my life, I have never smelt a scent that was sweeter than the natural body scent of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jabir, he would say, one of the younger of the companions. It was the habit of the Prophet ﷺ when he would come out of the masjid, the children would come running to him. And so he would come to them individually and pass his fragrant hand over their faces one after the other. Look at the rahmah, look at the mercy. Jabir said, and I was waiting and it was my turn. And he passed his hand over my face. He said, I will never forget how it felt. The coolness of it, it smelt as if he had just removed his hand from the bag of a perfume seller. Alayhi salatu was salam. Cold and subhanallah al azim scented. And perhaps, and maybe we will conclude with this, the most remarkable description we have of him has come to us by virtue of a, of a woman. It's always going to be the case. But she was an old woman, alhamdulillah, give her an excuse. 
This is the name of an old lady called Ummu Ba'bad al Khuzaiya. And this happened when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was migrating from Mecca to Medina. Mecca had rejected Islam. He wouldn't sit idle, twiddling his thumbs. He would search the world to present the religion. No obstacle is too great for a Muslim when Allah is his Lord. And so he makes his way immigrating from Mecca in secrecy all the way to Medina. He had nobody with him by the way, with the exception to Abu Bakr and Siddiq and a non-Muslim. Abdullah ibn Urayqid al-Layfi, his guide. They needed provisions. They came across a tent in the middle of the desert. They need to eat, they need to drink something to help the wayfarer proceed. They came into the tent, an old lady called Ummu Ba'bad, Imra'atun Jalda, a strong woman who would help the wayfarers. They said to her, Ummu Ba'bad, are you able to assist us? She said, by Allah, I have nothing to offer you on this day. And so a sheep caught the attention of our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the back of the tent. He said, what about the sheep that I see at the back of the tent? She said, this is a very weak sheep. The reason it is here is because it's too weak to go out and graze. It has no milk, it dried up years ago. He said, do you give me permission to try? She said, go ahead. So he went inside and this woman is observing, documenting, marveling. He knelt down next to the sheep and he began to make dua to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And then all of a sudden the other began to grow in size, filling with milk, subhanAllah. And he began to milk. And the first person who drank was the woman. And then he gave his companions to drink, including the non-Muslim. And he left a lot of milk for the house. And then he was the last person to drink alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu wassalam. He then took a pledge of allegiance. She took her shahada. She realized who was in front of her and they continued their journey to Medina. Later on in the day, in the day her husband Abu Ma'bad comes back home and he sees this milk all over the place. Subhanallah. He said to Abu Ma'bad, this goodness, this khair, this milk, where, where did it come from? No, no. A very blessed man passed by today. He said, give me his description of Ummu Ma'bad. Listen to her words. I saw a man of a glowing appearance, glowing, radiant in his face, perfect in his proportions. He was not ruined by an, a big belly, nor did he have an overly small head. Rather, he was a very handsome man. His eyes were intensely dark and his eyelashes were intensely long and his voice was very husky and there was length to his neck. His, his beard was full. His beard was full. And then she said azaj, meaning finely arched eyebrows. And then she said, even when he was silent, subhanAllah, she is describing his silence as well. When he was silent, he was so dignified. When he spoke, he was overcome with grandeur and, and splendor. He was the most handsome and beautiful of men from a distance, but the sweetest and most gentle from up close. And his speech was so nice. It was so clear. You didn't think that his speech was too long, nor was it too short. His speech were like pearls falling off, cascading from a string. A man of perfect proportions. You did not think that he was too tall, nor did you think him too short. It was like looking at three splendid branches, but he was the most beautiful and radiant of those branches. And then she concludes by saying he had companions who were surrounding him. If he instructed something, they rushed to fulfill it. When he spoke, they paid attention to every one of his words. He was well served and well attended. Although I never saw him frowning once nor did he miss out anybody in the gathering. La ilaha illa. He said, Ummu Ma'bad, that is the man we've been hearing about in Mecca who claims to be a prophet. And it's been my intention to go to him and meet him. And I intend to do so if I am given strength. Allahu Akbar. The final remark I want to share with you brothers and sisters is, what about us? We've heard so much about history, 
What about us? Where do we fit in all of all of this? Alhamdulillah, he has not neglected us. And he has something to say about you by name. He said that there will be people who will come after me. There will be some people after me who will love me so intensely that they, will, will, they would be willing to exchange their money and all of their family for a single glance at my face. He said they exist. He said they come after me. And I believe with yaqeen certainty that some of these men and women are with us today in this blessed masjid of ours. I don't doubt it. If a person was to say, figuratively speaking, I have a photo in my pocket of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I can only give it to you on condition that I strip you of the last penny to your name. Your phone, your shoes, your clothes, your business, your glasses, everything to your name. Your car, your bike, nothing. You're going home on the street, Haggard Center. And you will go home with no mom, no dad, no brother, no sister, no wife, no children. For what? For a single glance at this photo. He said there will be men and women who will accept it. That's the type of love that exists for him alayhi salatu wasalam, and which a lot of Muslims don't understand why we're so peeved off when they speak or depict him in ways that don't befit him alayhi salatu wasalam. Prove your love for him, my dear brother, my dear sister, practically. This is the true depiction of love, not verbal service or a day in the year or a night that you specify to celebrate him. True love is extended all throughout the year. And the best way to show that love is practically speaking. Financially, show your love for him. By removing the business, you know will be detracting from your relationship with him on the day of judgment and make it halal income. Even if you have to live on basic wage, wallahi, it is worth it. Wallahi, it is worth it. Wallahi, it is worth it. Prove your love to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my beloved brother, my respected sister, by revisiting those private conversations that only you and that person and before that Allah know about. Make it halal or cut it off once and for all and prove your love for him. Rethink your relationships, rethink your habits, rethink your urges, rethink the very first thought that comes into your mind when you're home alone. And the phone is next to you. Rethink it. My dear sister, your dress code. Practical manifestation of love. By changing it and rethinking it. A dress code that you would be happy for him to see you. And he will say, this is my 23 years of jihad and bleeding and sleepless nights. This is, mashallah, the person I left behind. This is how love is to be demonstrated. Oh, what he says, the very first condition of true love is obedience and compliance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us true inheritors of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to bless us with the opportunity of drinking from the, how, the pool on the Day of Judgment. We ask Allah Almighty to give this to our mothers and our fathers and our children and our imams and our guests and our students and all of those who have a right upon us. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. Hope this video was helpful for you. This may help others too, so please consider sharing and we will bring more videos in the future inshallah. So consider subscribing and you won't miss any. Jazakallah khairan.